1944, 50 African-American naval workers were jailed and court-martialed for mutiny. These Port Chicago workers were protesting working conditions after a tragic explosion killed 320 men and destroyed two ships. Their actions shifted public view on segregation in the armed services and led to the triumph of the desegregation of the Navy in 1946. By 1944, the war in the Pacific was heating up and brought with it an increased demand for ammunition and ships to deliver vital war supplies. While they were permitted to work, African American naval draftees were not permitted to serve on ships and were restricted to segregated labor on land. A promotion was nearly impossible, much harder than it was for white naval servicemen. At Port Chicago, near San Francisco, they served by loading ammunition onto ships for fight in the Pacific. In July 1944, Port Chicago was home to 1,400 enlisted men, 71 white officers, 230 civilian employees and contractors, and 106 marine guards. The men were treated like a different species. While they worked in segregated units, their commanding officers were always white. These servicemen received very little training on how to load cargo, never mind explosives. The men often created their own rules on the pier, competing to see who could load the most cargo the fastest. Ammunition was passed hand-to-hand -hand or on carts. The men rolled large bombs down the dock to a waiting cargo net. Spare plywood secured the ammunition in the ship's hold. The men didn't have knowledge of how the bombs functioned, either. On one occasion, they were loading a ship when one of the bombs started leaking red fluid. Thinking the bomb was about to explode, the men loading the ship scrambled to escape, not knowing that the red fluid was, in fact, a packet of dye at the front of the bomb designed to allow soldiers to see where their individual bombs were hitting. They had no experience. They were completely unknowledgeable in what they were risking their lives with. On July 17, 1944, 98 men from the 3rd Division were loading the E.A. Bryant. 102 were rigging the Keenault Victory, loading both ships with incendiary and fragmentation bombs, bullets, and depth charges. An additional 120 men were on the pier or on the ships, some as sailors performing normal duties, and others being naval guards stationed at the pier. Some of the bombs weighed as much as 2,000 pounds each. By evening, the ships held 4,606 tons of munitions, with an additional 429 tons and rail cars on the dock. At 10.18 p.m., witnesses saw a brilliant white flash and heard a deafening boom. All 320 men on duty were instantly killed. Yellow smoke billowed out, accompanied by a series of smaller explosions. The keynote victory broke in two, rode a 200-foot shockwave, and was set down on its side in the middle of the bay, partially sunk. Six seconds later, the E.A. Bryant went up in a single massive explosion that instantly disintegrated the entire ship. An army bomber, flying overhead at 9,000 feet, reported seeing house-sized pieces of metal glowing white-hot flying past the plane. A shell hit a passing tanker but did not explode. Off-duty men sprung into action, putting out fires that threatened more train cars full of ammunition. Once the immediate danger passed, the men began retrieving the bodies of their fallen comrades, strewn all across that part of the bay. Jack Crittenden, an African-American serviceman, recounted his experience to writer Robert Allen, an author on the disaster, saying, I was there the next morning. We went back to the dock. Man, it was awful. That was a sight. You'd see a shoe with a foot in it, and then you remember how you joked about who was going to be the first one out of the hold if something went wrong. You'd see a head floating across the water. Just the head. Or an arm. A court of inquiry found that no one was responsible for the disaster. The valuation of property destroyed in the explosion was roughly $9 million, equivalent to $141.7 million in today's money. All of the white officers got 30 days leave to recover and see their families after the disaster. The African American servicemen did not. They quickly returned to work, moving first to Camp Shoemaker, then to the Mare Island Naval Shipyard and Barracks, where they arrived on August 8th, 22 days after the explosion. The men weren't sure what kind of work they would do next, but the assumption was that they would be loading ammunition again, likely with very little improvement on safety practices. Mare Island had somewhat taken over Port Chicago's role as a naval staging area after the explosion. Lieutenant Ernest DeLucci, commander of the 4th Division, 
was informed that the men would be going back to work the following day, and that he would be the one to inform them. The following day, Bellucci arrived at the barracks at 1.30 to assemble the men for work. When he arrived, he saw members of the 8th Division also there. He heard one of the men yell, Don't go to work for the white motherfuckers. Bellucci wasn't sure who had yelled, so no one was punished. What he didn't know was that the night before, the men had stayed up in their barracks discussing whether to work or not. Many had voiced concerns about their safety and worries about how little the Navy had done to create new safety protocols. Despite the outcry, Delucci lined the men up and began to march them to the dock, where a barge was waiting to take them to work. The men came to a fork in the road and heard the command to proceed to the barge. The men stopped. Delucci gave the order again. No one moved. Delucci called for Joseph Small, considered one of the leaders amongst the men. Small told Delucci that he was afraid to work. Delucci asked the rest of the men if they too were cowards. As a group, the men responded that they would not work. Questioned individually, 96 men said that they would not work, saying that they were afraid for their lives. Just eight agreed to work. Of the 328 men in several divisions that were ordered to work that day, 258 men refused. The following day, Admiral Carlton Wright threatened the men with execution by a firing squad. He said, I want to remind you men that mutinous conduct in time of war carries the death sentence, and the hazards of facing a firing squad are far greater than the hazards of handling ammunition. The entire 8th Division had had enough of being threatened and berated. They agreed to return to work. 44 men from the 2nd and 4th Divisions joined them. The Admiral recommended that the 208 men who had relented should only receive light sentences for disobeying orders, but the men who continued to refuse to work should be court-martialed for mutiny. President Franklin D. Roosevelt was informed of the situation and agreed with the Admiral that the 208 men who had resumed work should receive only light sentences, but did not mention the other 15 men who were still refusing to work. Early in September, the 50 men were officially charged with conspiracy to make a mutiny, a charge that could carry the death penalty. The African American press grabbed onto the story. They considered this to be now a race issue, discerning whether the men had any right to mutiny. It was thought by the media that if the men were white, they would likely be facing less of a penalty, if at all. Papers such as the Chicago Defender and Atlanta Daily World supported the men and covered as much as they could of the trial. Langston Hughes wrote an opinion article supporting the men. The court martial started on September 14, 1944, on Yerba Buena Island in the middle of the San Francisco Bay. Rear Admiral Hugo Osterhaus acted as judge and jury in the case, which was the largest mass trial in naval history. The defense argued that the men should not be convicted of mutiny because they were willing to work but not under the unsafe conditions that were present at Port Chicago. It didn't matter. The 208 men who voluntarily resumed work received a fine of three months' pay and were dishonorably discharged. The 50 men who steadfastly refused were found guilty of mutiny and sentenced to 15 years in prison. Admiral Wright reviewed the sentence, and some of the men received reduced sentences as a result, as Wright thought the sentences were too heavy for them. Thurgood Marshall, who had attended some of the trials, started formulating appeals. He argued that no direct order was made to load ammunition, so therefore the mutiny charge was not applicable. Marshall also attacked the prosecutor, saying that he had intentionally misled the court on the law surrounding mutinous conduct. In January 1946, 47 of the 50 men were released from prison, but not from the Navy. They spent the next few months at sea on a probationary period and were eventually discharged over the course of that year. After the Port Chicago mutiny and some other protests, it was quickly decided that segregation had no place in the Navy. Slowly but surely, the Navy began to integrate. In June 1945, the Navy announced that segregating soldiers and training and other programs would end. The entire Navy integrated in 1947, with the rest of armed forces following over the next couple of years. The Port Chicago disaster and subsequent mutiny was a horrible tragedy that caused the deaths of 320 men, but led to the anti-segregation movement triumphing in the form of integration of the armed forces. The men's refusal to work helped bring about social change.